it's always a, a it's always a pleasure to uh, introduce um, Julio uh, Fiore, and um, I know I've known Julio. Now I was looking at I think first came to work with us as a postdoc with my group almost ten years ago. So that's kind of crazy. It's gone it's gone by very very quickly, and um, has has you know completely elevated the quality and quantity of our research. So he's pretty, pretty great. Um, so officially, Giulio uh, Fiore is assistant professor in the Department of Surgery um, and a surgical outcomes a researcher focused on improving uh, outcomes after surgery. Uh, he previously originally uh, trained as a physiotherapist and then um, continued his training with a PhD at Melbourne University and then uh, with us uh, for his postdoctoral training um, and is now assistant professor in our, our department. Um, he also, um, he's, he's published um, extensively. He's, his group uh, is very well funded. Um, and um, uh, he also has, he has great students who uh, are, uh, are, are really uh, doing great, really well themselves. Um, he also has a variety of leadership positions that you may know him from uh, in the department, including in experimental surgery. In the Department of Surgery, he oversees, directs our surgeon scientist program, um, and in experimental surgery has uh, introduced the and leads the uh, surgical outcomes uh, concentration. Uh, so uh, without further, further uh, delay, I'll hand the, hand the mic over to Julio is going to present uh, one of his passions, I think probably his, his main passion right now, which is uh, trying to uh, uh, get surgeons to stop using uh, so much opioid analgesia for patients. All right, hello everyone. It's great to be here. Really appreciate the invitation and thanks for the very nice introduction, Dr. Feldman. So the main message that I like to deliver in this presentation is that despite being widely prescribed in North America, there is in fact very limited evidence supporting opioid prescribing for pain management after post-operative discharge. And most importantly, I will tell you about some of the research that we are conducting to bridge this major knowledge gap. I trust that most of you have heard that North America is currently living a devastating crisis of opioid use and overdose. Only in Canada, opioids caused over 15,000 deaths since 2016. And this represents over 3,800 opioid related deaths per year. And shockingly, this means that more than 10 people die from opioid overdoses every day in Canada. And in the US, these numbers are even more staggering with close to 50,000 deaths per year, meaning that over 130 people die from opioid overdoses every day. And although many people thought that the COVID-19 pandemic would slow down the opioid crisis with less people being out on the streets, the pandemic actually made the opioid crisis even worse. So deaths from opioid overdoses really skyrocketed uh, sky rocked both in the US and Canada in 2020 and 2021, with a 30 to 40% increase in the number of overdose deaths. And this increased uh, number of deaths is attributed to pandemic-related um, stress and social isolation leading to changes in drug use behaviors. Erratic and volatile drug supply due to border and travel restri restrictions. And also what most believe to be the most important factor, reduce accessibility to addiction, mental health and harm reduction services for people with opioid use disorders. Our surgeons and of course other perioperative clinicians of course have the best intentions when prescribing opioid drugs to reduce pain and improve patient comfort after surgery. And although this practice seemed harmless for many, many years, it's now well recognized that post-operative overprescription over is an important contributor to the current opioid crisis. Surgeons who are the 
main responsible for opioid prescribing at surgical discharge are the second largest subgroup of specialists involved in opioid prescribing, prescribing coming only after pain, uh, pain medicine specialists. The literature supports that 6 to 17% of patients become chronic opioid users after surgery. And also, very importantly, estimates also point out that 40 to 70% of all opioid pre, uh, pills prescribed to surgical patients go unused. And this is particularly relevant that these unused pills often become a source of opioid diver diversion for no medical use by others. So in light of these numbers, the literature supports that the impact of surgeons on the opioid crisis cannot be underestimated. And the issue of opioid overprescribing, however, seems to be highly concentrated in North America with very limited impact in other parts of the world. And as uh, you guys can probably recognize from my accent, as Dr. Feldman mentioned, like I'm not from North America, but I have been living in Montreal for almost 10 years now. And I'm originally, I was born and raised in Brazil where I started my training. I also received some training in Australia. And here in Montreal, I work with a surgical outcomes research group that is proudly multi-international and includes scientists, clinician scientists, and also graduate students coming from several parts of the world. And when the impact of surgery on the opioid crisis started making the headlines of our major uh, surgical journals a few years ago, our international team members got really intrigued. And a very common reaction was, what is happening here? Clinicians back home rarely prescribe opioids after surgical discharge. And in fact, the literature really supports this impression as surgeries have shown huge discrepancies in opioid prescribing, especially between countries in North America versus um, other continents. In the US, for example, we are talking about 80 to 92% of patients receiving an opioid prescription after discharge compared to only around 5% in other countries in Europe, South America, Asia, and also the Middle East. And when hearing about these international differences in how opioids are prescribed, of course, some questions may cross your mind. Maybe patients just receive better care in Canada and the US, and in other countries, surgical patients just agonizing pain. Well, research definitely does not support that. Like, I won't go into too much detail for the sake of time, but several studies support the opposite. Surgical patients in other countries, especially in Europe, they report less pain and also better satisfaction with pain control in comparison to North American patients. And obviously, you may also wonder why. Why do clinicians in North America prescribe so much opioids after surgery compared to other countries? And this is what we'll cover in the next session of this presentation. Well, the topic as of why clinicians in North America prescribe so much opioids is extremely complex and difficult to cover in a 30-minute talk, but the reason for the over-reliance of opioids here in Canada and the US include established prescribing behaviors learned in medical school and also specialty training with a dogma that opioids are the most effective or analgesic for managing acute pain. But as you will see, this statement is not supported by current evidence. And this dogma was also further reinforced by unproven pharma claims regarding the efficacy and safety of opioids with extremely heavy advertisement of opioid drugs, especially in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, opioid medications, they're relatively cheap to produce. And if they are consumed in a large scale, uh, profits are really certain for pharma companies. Hence, hence this obsession for opioid marketing that we saw in the, um, in the 90s. And I, just wanted to show you a quick example to illustrate. This is part of an ad for OxyContin, which is a slow-release opioid, opioid produced by Purdue Pharma, 
which is a company that is still paying billions of dollars in lawsuits for mislabeling and making false claims regarding uh, the drug that they were producing. These are the same drugs that have a reputation for causing addiction and other terrible things. Now, in fact, drugs of addiction amongst pain patients who are treated by doctors is much less than 1%. They don't wear out, they go on working, they do not have serious medical side effects. And so these drugs, which I repeat, are our best, strongest pain medications, should be used much more than they are for patients in pain. So this is essentially what um, clinicians were led to believe in the 1990s, that opioids were extremely safe and extremely effective. And it was by that time that rates of opioids prescription started increasing uh, substantially, both in the US and in Canada. So essentially, as you guys could see, they were guilt tripping clinicians to prescribe opioids to potentially prevent unnecessary uh, patient suffering. And another reported reason for opioid overprescription over in North America is convenience for clinicians. This is because for clinicians, targeting post-operative analgesia for the worst possible pain outcome may avoid the inconvenience of receiving a phone call after hours and also prevent patients returning to the hospital or the clinician's clinic, which may increase healthcare costs. And also another reason for opioid overprescribing over is the need to meet patient expectations and also ensure patient satisfaction. And this is especially important in healthcare systems where patient satisfaction is linked to hospital reimbursement, such as the United States. So prescribing behaviors learned during medical training, unproven claims above, uh, by pharma industry. Convenience for clinicians and avoidance of patient dissatisfactions have been pointing, pointed out as potential reasons for the over-reliance of opioids to manage pain in North America. And this is what shaped our co current uh, prescribing culture. And for, just for a more broad overview on this topic, I highly encourage you guys to read this article by a dentist called Paul Moore. And it was published a few years ago, but it's really worth the, the read if you're interested in this topic. So overall, the data and the rationale that I've presented so far supports that the decision to prescribe comparative effectiveness studies to guide um, clinical decision making. And as most of you know, the gold standard study designed to assess comparative effectiveness of different interventions such as opioid versus opioid free analgesia are randomized controlled trials or RCTs and also systematic reviews and meta-analysis combining the results from these different RCTs. Are you guys hearing me well? Like I'm receiving a notification that the internet is unstable? Yep. Cool, sounds good, perfect. All right. So when our group became interested in this research topic about three years ago, one of the first thing that we observed is that the literature on opioid-free post-operative post -operative analgesia seemed to be quite sparse and heterogeneous. So the first step that we took in our um, uh, post-operative analgesia research program was to conduct a scoping review to assess the extent, range, and nature of the literature addressing opioid-free analgesia after major surgery, which were defined as uh, any surgery conducted in a hospital OR. And for this literature mapping exercise, we included studies addressing opioid-free analgesia, with any type of study design from case studies to randomized control trials. 
And of course, because this was a scoping review, we were mostly interested in obtaining data regarding study, study characteristics rather than methodological quality or even study results. And this review was enormous, as you guys can imagine. We screened almost 60,000 abstracts and identified a total of 424 studies describing post-operative uh, opioid free analgesia strategies. And here are some of the major, our, our major findings that I'd like to call your attention to. In my opinion, the most striking finding was the low number of studies on opioid-free analgesia conducting in North America, with only 1% of the studies conduct coming from Canada and 3% of the studies coming from the United States. Studies were also highly focused on obstetrics, ortho, and general surgery, with limited focus on other surgical specialties. There was also limited focus on non-pharmacological interventions, which may be important adjuncts to post-operative pain management. Another relevant finding was that only 42 studies out of the 424, or around like 10%, addressed opioid-free interventions after hospital discharge. And only seven of these studies were randomized control trials. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we did not identify any systematic review or meta-analysis summarizing the results from different RCTs to inform prescription decision-making. So in order to bridge the latter knowledge gap, we recently finalized a formal meta-analysis of RCT, which summarized the evidence regarding the comparative effectiveness of opioid versus opioid-free analgesia after post-operative discharge. And our study protocol was published in BMJ Open for those who are interested in having a closer look. And our final report has recently been accepted for publication in The Lancet, which is one of the most traditional and respected medical journals in the world with an impact factor close to 80. So like, this is a huge career achievement for me and my team and something that we are really beyond excited about. So hopefully this article will be coming out in the next few weeks. So in this review, we targeted randomized controlled trials comparing opioid to opioid free analgesia after discharge. And we were looking at discharge after any surgical procedure from dental to major thoracoabdominal surgeries. And our primary outcome of interest were patient reported pain on post-discharge day one with the measure, all the measures standardized into a visual analog scale and also adverse events, in particular uh, vomiting. And the quality of the RCTs included were assessed according to the Cochran risk of bias tool. We conducted um, random effect meta-analysis to combine our results and certainty of evidence was assessed using grade. And Another methodological aspect of our study that is important to note is that to facilitate the interpretation of our as cholecystectomies and inguinal hernia repairs, and also breast and thyroid surgeries. Another group were major surgeries, which included colon, liver, and kidney resections, for example. And finally, major extended surgeries, which included, for example, multi-organ resections and thoracoabdominal procedures. So after an extensive literature search, a total of 47 RCTs met our eligibility criteria. 30 of the RCTs involved minor surgeries, 17 involved moderate surgeries or surgeries of moderate extent. But unfortunately, we did not identify any RCTs focused on major or major complex procedures. And these are the, res um, the results regarding our primary outcome, pain intensity on post-discharge day one. So 
among the studies involving minor surgery, the great, great majority uh, involve dental procedures, especially molar extractions. And among the surgeries of moderate extent, 47% were orthopedic surgeries. Uh, most of them involved arthroscopic uh, joint repairs. And 29 were uh, RCTs focused on general surgery procedures, uh, including, again, cholecystectomies, hernia repairs, and mastectomies. And in terms of study quality, um, about 60% of the RCTs identified had low quality or high risk of bias, however you want to call it. And now zooming in to see our pool results, this diamond shape here in the middle represents the mean difference between groups and the 95% confidence intervals. And for the results to be statistically significant, the whole diamond needs to be on one or the other side of the neutral line, which is the zero line that we see here in the middle. And these blue lines um, that you see here represent what is considered to be a clinically relevant change in uh, visual analog scale scores. And in this case, um, minimum important difference for VAS after surgery has been previously, previously established in the literature to be around one centimeter. So for the differences uh, between groups to be clinically meaningful, the whole diamond needs uh, to be beyond one of these lines that represent the minimum important difference. So what our results are showing here is that any impact of opioids on pain in the first day post-discharge is not statistically significant. You see that the diamond shape here is right in the middle and the confidence intervals do not cross that line. And the difference was also like very far from being uh, clinically meaningful in relation to the minimum important differences seen here. So overall, we did not find statistical or clinically meaningful differences between opioid and opioid-free analgesia on post-discharge day one. And according to GREAT, the certainty of evidence for this finding was moderate. And of course, we were dealing with very heterogeneous trials in terms of like surgical populations, context of care, and also the analgesia regimens offered to patients were widely variable. So to deal with heterogeneity, we conducted numerous subgroup analysis, for example, by comparing studies involving minor to and moderate surgeries, day surgery versus inpatient surgery, studies with high versus low risk of bias, use of opioid as needed versus around the clock, and so on. But no matter how much we tortured the data, we found no differences in postoperative pain when comparing opioid versus opioid-free analgesia. And in addition to pain on post-discharge day one, we also did not find differences in pain on other um, days post-discharge with certainty of evidence uh, varying from very low to moderate. And also we did not find differences in other outcomes, including pain interference, quality of recovery, satisfaction with pain management, and also healthcare reutilization. And the um, certainty of evidence here also varied from very low to moderate. However, very importantly, in addition to not improving outcomes, opioid prescribing did significantly increase adverse events, including nausea, vomiting, constipation, dizziness, and drowsiness, with certainty of evidence here ranging from moderate to high. So in conclusion, the findings from this meta-analysis support that opioid prescribing a surgical discharge does not reduce pain intensity, but does increase adverse events. However, evidence relied on trials focused on, surg uh, on surgeries of minor and moderate extent, suggesting that clinicians can consider prescribing opioid free analgesia in the surgical settings, but the results are not generalizable to procedures of, of uh, major or uh, moderate complex extent. And also it's important to note that data were largely derived from low, low quality trials. So there is a great need to advance the quality of research in this field. And this is exactly where our current research efforts are focused on right now, on advancing the quality of research in the field of post-operative um, opioid free analgesia prescribing. 
So in terms of our current research, our team is particularly interested in general surgery. So an important step that we took toward our, uh, the future of our research program was conducting a pilot trial, which aimed to investigate the feasibility of conducting a full-scale RCT, assessing the comparative effectiveness of opioid versus opioid-free analgesia after outpatient general surgery. And for this pilot trial, we assembled a huge group of collaborators across the MUHC, including surgeons, anesthetists, pain specialists, and also outcomes researchers like me. And the trial was a parallel multi-dose to group assessor blind pilot RCT, and we aim to recruit 80 adult patients and they're going out the patient procedures in both uh, general abdominal and breast surgeries. And the patients were recruited at both the MGH and the, the RVH. And our main exclusion, exclusion criteria were contraindications to the drugs used in the trial and also complications um, requiring hospital stay. And the patients were randomized into two groups. And opioid analgesia group, where patients received around-the-clock non-opioid analgesics, such as acetaminophen and or NSAIDs, plus opioid tablets to be taken as needed um, in case of breakthrough pain. And this is our current um, standard care in the institutions where patients were recruited. Or patients were, random were randomized to receive opioid-free analgesia, where these patients received around-the-clock non-opioid analgesics, and in case of breakthrough pain, rescue analgesia was provided by increasing doses and or adding non-opioid drugs that were not included in the initial regimen. And all these analgesia regimens has been set by our uh, team according to Health Canada monograph for like efficacy and safe dosing. And since this was a pilot trial, our primary focus was on feasibility criteria defined um, a priori. And we hope that at least 70% of the patients screened would be eligible to be randomized. At least 50% of patients who are eligible agreed to participate in the study. And over 50% of the patients who are randomized completed the outcome assessment at 30 days. And in addition to these feasibility outcomes, other outcomes included um, seven-day pain uh, severity and interference as measured using the brief pain inventory uh, questionnaire, time to stop in pain medication, post-operative health status as measured using the PROMISE 29, adverse drug events, unplanned healthcare utilization, and also satisfaction with pain management. And for this pilot trial, data were analyzed pretty much using descriptive statistics and effect estimates for the, for the, the outcomes that I just uh, described, because according to consort, uh, we should not use uh, inferential statistics in terms of p-values in pilot trial, because such analysis would likely be underpowered. And the findings from this study, um, this pilot study would of course, will be used to inform the primary outcome and also sample size calculations for the future for, for scale RCT. So in total, we randomized 81 patients from January to September 2020. Five of these patients had to be excluded post-randomization due to complications um, requiring hospital stay. And we also had a few patients who had contraindication to NSAIDs that were identified only after surgery. So in total, we had 76 patients, including the intention to treat analysis, 39 received opioids, and 37 received uh, opioid-free analgesia. And all the feasibility criteria set a priori were fulfilled, supporting that the full-scale RCT that we're planning will be is very likely to be feasible. And overall, the groups were very similar in terms of patient and surgery characteristics, although some imbalances were expected due to our low sample size. So for example, our rates of abdominal and breast surgery were like pretty much 50 feet to 50, like between groups. And as a pragmatic trial, we did not influence any analgesia strategies uh, given um, during hospital stay. So we can see here, for example, they're like, 
exactly six patients in each group received peripheral nerve blocks in the OR, which and which is a strategy known to be like relevant to reduce pain in the first few hours after surgery. And these are our results for the measure of pain intensity and pain interference from post-operative day one to post-discharge uh, uh, day seven. And the interpretation of this plot here is very similar to what we saw in the meta-analysis. So the blue points here are the mean differences between groups and the bars that you see here are the 95% confidence intervals. And here in the middle, you see the lines representing no differences and the red lines here are the minimal important differences of um, in, uh, previously defined to be like one. And what you can see here is that for both pain intensity and pain interference, um, any differences between opioid and opioid free analgesia is very, very close to zero and very far from the line representing minimal important difference. So this really shows that like we did not identify any obvious differences in pain intensity and interference and patients received opioid or opioid free analgesia. But obviously we cannot reach any meaningful conclusion from this data because this pilot trial was not powered to detect uh, differences in outcomes. And rates of adverse events at seven days tended to be higher in the opioid group, as you can see here in terms of like nausea, vomiting, and constipation. And other findings that are relevant to note is that a very high percentage of patients in the opioid group did not take the opioids that were prescribed to them. So these represent like 59% of patients in that group. And only one patient in the opioid free analgesia group reported uncontrolled pain and received an op ended up receiving an opioid prescription post discharge. And also embedded in this pilot study, we also conducted a qualitative study to explore um, patients and clinicians' perspectives and experiences with the pilot trial. And overall, findings from this qualitative study suggested that both patients and clinicians generally recognized the need for trials in this area. And they also provided interesting ideas and input on how to refine the full scale trial. So, overall, this pilot study provided very encouraging results and supported the feasibility of a full scale RCT uh, focused on opioid free analgesia after outpatient general surgery. And as future directions, obviously our next step following this pilot RCT is to conduct a full-scale trial, hopefully starting from 2023. And we are looking to apply for a big grant for this study. And our um, goal is to expand this RCT to other hospitals within the Magill network, including, for example, the Jewish, St. Mary's and Lachine, and also find other um, centers to collaborate, uh, centers to collaborate in these studies, uh, in this study across Canada. And this full-scale trial, of course, has a great potential to contribute practice-changing evidence to help mitigating opioid overprescribing the surgical population. And in addition to this RCT, I'd also like to mention a few other projects that our group is conducting to better inform evidence-based um, post-operative analgesia prescribing. And these include and includes an ongoing meta-analysis focused on non-pharmacological interventions to manage pain after abdominal surgery. Because as I previously mentioned, non-pharmacological interventions such as, for example, code therapy, cognitive behavior strategies, and even music um, can be important adjuncts to opioid free analgesia, but research in this field remains uh, extremely limited. So this meta-analysis um, really aims to bridge this knowledge gap. And another um, ongoing research is this cohort study evaluating opioid prescribing and consumption uh, following discharge after colorectal surgery. And this study will hopefully pave the way for a future RCT, which we are already planning. And we are also almost finalized data collection for a similar study focused on bariatric surgery, which hopefully will also pave the way for a future RCT. 
And recently our lab also partnered up with McGill's Department of Gynecology to collaborate on studies focused on post-operative analgesia after cesarean delivery. And so far, our research on C-sections include the uh, meta-analysis that you see detailed here on the screen. And we're also conducting a cohort study uh, in collaboration with our gyne group. And lastly, I'd like to mention an ongoing international qualitative study focused on surgeons' perceptions, attitudes, and beliefs regarding the prescription of opioids and opioid-free analgesia after post-operative discharge. And we're hoping that findings from this study will provide insights into how, how to better translate research knowledge into changes in practice and also help us identify further knowledge gaps to be filled by future research. And as our research program have already highlighted, there are numerous research gaps in the field of post-operative analgesia prescribing, especially in terms of the comparative effectiveness of opioid versus opioid-free analgesia. And given the urgent need to tackle the current opioid crisis, high quality research in this field are very likely to be practice changing. And this is one of the reasons why this field of research is so fascinating and we really welcome future collaborations. So in summary, although opioids are the mainstay treatment for acute pain in North America, current evidence supports that opioid prescribing at surgical discharge does not improve pain outcomes, but does increase adverse events. However, there is still a great need to advance the quality and scope of research in this field. After all, post-operative analgesia prescribing should be guided by evidence rather than by tradition and dogma. And thanks so much for your attention and a special shout out to the people who actually do the work that I just presented. So here we see Christos and Elahi, a postdoctoral fellows who just started in our lab, uh, Gadir and McKenna, PhD candidates, Maxime, Phil, Charbel, Ewan, Katie, and Trida, who are master's students. And also a huge thanks to Hiba, our research assistant, and Peppa, our research coordinator. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, is uh, Dr. Feldman here? I'm not sure if she had to leave. Okay, so uh, I will have to. I, I know you have to leave, uh, Julio. So wonderful. I have, I have, thanks so much. I have ten minutes for questions. Okay, excellent. Oh, so that yeah. was a wonderful presentation. So, uh, Don, I think you have a question. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a quick question. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. Super interesting. And I find this field of research very interesting. Even more so also, we see something very similar in the pediatric um, surgical field as well. Um, I'm more interested in the part of what drives people to not participate in, in this in this study. Um, is there a certain knowledge um, that these patients have regarding opioid use or pain management? which causes them not to, um, to participate in this study and would, let's say, prefer to have opioids um, analgesia post-surgery? Yeah, this, that, that's a very interesting question. That's like one of the main reasons why we wanted to include this qualitative component in our pilot RCT. So among the patients who were interviewed, we saw kind of like a very clear division of patients who are like extremely scared of using opioids because like we're really like at the peak of the, the opioid crisis when like these patients were being like interviewed and based on what they were seeing in, in the news or seeing like pre or having themselves previous experiences or having family members with like experience with like opioid side effects they would much prefer not receiving opioids after surgery but the, we also had the other extreme patients who thought that the drugs that are offered over the counter, like 
ibuprofen, Tylenol, like they don't do anything for pain and that the only way for their pain to be treated is with opioids. So this will be like one of the main, one like one of the biggest challenge for like recruiting patients for the full scale RCT. But a good thing is that like, based on our previous like the meta-analysis that I presented, at least we have some evidence that supports the equipoise of like opioid versus opioid free analgesia. So like probably at the time of recruitment, we are able, we will be able to like present this data and show that like this is really a field where we don't have a right or wrong answer. Thank you. Ovidio? Yes, bom uh, dia, professor. Sure. Bom dia. Your Portuguese, your Portuguese is much better than my French. That's great. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I speak all of them badly. Um, <laughs> uh, there is a very interesting because you spoke about the the word at large, and in the word at large, uh, there is a drug that it's actually extremely used but not in the Anglo-Saxon countries because of a very interesting uh, uh, metabolic uh, 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 property of uh, uh, giving um, um, uh, secondary effects to Anglo-Saxon population. And that one it's metamizole or dipirone, mm -hmm. which in Brazil, for example, in Sao Paulo, was in 2016 they sold 500 tons of it and it's extremely effective you can buy it in germany i use it for my headaches and for my pains and after i had surgeries here i was given the <clears throat> popular uh, oxycodone and uh, the constipation was so bad that i switched back to metamizole and i think it that uh, uh, and, and then in, in, in um, two years ago in Israel, they kind of made the correlation that if you use the, this metamizole, the dipirone, uh, it goes in direct proportion with the use of opioids. So basically it's not such a bad idea. And the, uh, the side effects are five times less than diclofenac, which is actually used on large scale and actually gives much more uh, uh, debilitating gastrointestinal uh, side effects. Do you think that um, um, researching this type of molecule and kind of figuring out what is this kind of interesting genetic uh, metabolic property, and I posted a, 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 a link in, in the chat, uh, <clears throat> will, will lead to this kind of like dependence of opioids that, and, that, and I know from proper experience from my carpal tunnel operation, I, I, I uh, just exiting the hospital, they, they just give me a hundred pills of, of oxycodone, which uh, overkill, it's another statement. Um, and uh, I, I just took like 10 metamizoles and everything was fine. But you cannot find those in, in here. And I think <clears throat> like the, 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 the 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 study that was done two years ago i think this diprone it's a good medication with a bad reputation um what 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 do you see happening in in that direction because we're just talking to like you mentioned in like well this is how we do it and we have just nsa's and 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 and, 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 and uh, tylenol and and they basically don't don't work this is a this is a great point like um like as you mentioned like in brazil dipirone like is widely used uh, widely prescribed as a medication that you can buy over the counter and i believe they are even like more widely used compared to like NSAIDs or acetaminophen and like, and this happens like all across like South America. Also like Spain is a like country that uses uh, Dipiron quite a lot. And yeah, In I wasn't German, sure. I, yeah, I wasn't sure about Germany. Yeah, but that's- Germany, great. that's where I get my, my thing. I have my yeah. friend that prescribes me like 
clinical quantities of that just to yeah. kind of that's what I smuggled from Germany. But I totally agree. Like this, like deeper on like. My understanding is that like the mechanism of like action, it's not like super well understood, but like at the same, same time, we still don't know how acetaminophen works and like the drug is like widely prescribed. And I totally agree that the drug has a bad like reputation, especially in North America, because like some research, if I'm not wrong, like from the 80s, like showed some like bone marrow toxicity, but I think that like, comp like, as you mentioned, like comparing like head to head, the potential side effects of like deep urine compa in comparison to like the short term side effects of opioids in terms of nausea, vomiting, constipation, et cetera. And the uh, like really catastrophic side effects on like long term in terms of like opioid um, dependency. Like this drug is a drug that really deserves to be like revisited by both the NI, both the, the FDA and Health Canada. And I know that there is a physiatrist from Toronto, like she's Brazilian, her name is Andrea Furlan. And if I'm not wrong, she was in touch with Health Canada to like bring like this issue up for like patients for, with both like chronic and acute pain to see if the approval of metamisole slash like dipirone could be like revisited here. But that's a very great point. Dr. Hurley. Julio, congratulations um, on, uh, on all your work, especially your Lancelot publication. That's very exciting. Um, so much, Jason. I had a bigger picture question. Um, so it sounds like the landscape of opioids has been changing uh, necessarily in terms of there's more um, patient awareness in terms of the problems and side effects of opioids and opioid addiction. Um, and there's historically been a lot of, uh, you know, pharmaceutical, I guess, um, advocating uh, for opioids being used. Um, I guess in the in the bigger picture, because I find your research, you know, it's so interesting and so and it has such a, you know, a, there's obviously a place for it, um, not just in surgical practice, but also how patients understand and make decisions um, around that. Um, I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, kind of what your plans are for knowledge dissemination, you know, with your work um, to different communities and how you think uh, that some of the evidence that you're accumulating. And also, you know, uh, I like that you're doing qualitative studies to complement what you're doing as well, so you understand perspectives. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you feel um, your work fits in um, to uh, improving understanding and also changing practice, um, both maybe again from um, what's, what's recommended um, as well as the individual recommendations that physicians make and then patient behavior. Yeah, that's a great point, Jason. So, yeah, like we are trying not necessarily to move in that direction, but to include that direction, like within our research program. So the whole goal of like including this qualitative component was to start like bringing in the perspective of both like clinicians and to practice. So McKenna, my PhD student, like she's doing this qualitative work, more focused on like the clinician's perspective, but we are really planning to do more qualitative work with patients. I have um, a research associate, she's a nurse like with research focus on qualitative work. She's coming from Iran like, and the whole plan of her like, um, the program that she will like develop within my lab is on evaluating like patients' perspectives to hopefully facilitate um, knowledge translation. Super. And yeah, and I would be like very interested in hearing your perspectives about that and like having you like on board for this research because I know that like that's uh, part of your research interest as well. Oh, happy to help. Maybe side, side conversation. Amazing. Oh, one last question. So, Dr. Dr. Fiore, that was excellent. And the congratulations on the Lancet 
that's a really huge achievement. Uh, I think uh, people just dream of the Lancet and you have a dream. <laughs> so <Definitely>. thank you. <laughs> yeah, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, have a thank nice you so day. much. Appreciate the invitation and thanks everyone for listening. Cheers, guys. Yeah, cheers. Thanks. Bye-bye.